Our next speaker is Jane Burns. We're staying in the US um, with our next speaker. Jane Burns is very much also a badass. Um, Jane's, Jane's career path has been a real representation of, of the evolving role of the information profession. She's currently research manager at the Health Professions Education Centre at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. But she's worked in libraries in third level institutions, in government libraries, in health sciences and in digital media. And she's even worked in a library specialising in soft condensed matter, but even in an hour interviewing her for Librarians Allowed, I didn't manage to figure out what that was. Um, Jane serves on the Library Association of Ireland's Executive Council, the Career Development Committee and the Task Force for Information Literacy. She's also a published author and the Open Access Development Manager for Anlarlan. She lectures on management for information professionals at UCD School of Information Studies and she's a PhD candidate at UCD School of Education. And somewhere in between doing all of these things, she manages to be the oracle for Irish librarians old and new. And she makes the rest of us feel like we have to try harder. So whatever it is Jane Burns now has to say about loving to learn, we all need to open our ears and listen up. Give it up for Jane Burns. Thanks, Laura. Well, I'm definitely going to Alison's workshop. Is anybody else? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here at ANSL. To begin with, I'd like to set some ground, or grounding statements in relation to the case study that I'm presenting. There are many types of CPD, many ways to achieve it and develop it, and in lots of different formats. I think most of us are familiar with the top three listed, but I'm going to concentrate on the last three for today. And these are CPD that we learn from other professions. I'll be giving some examples from the areas of taxation, medicine, and digital imagery. CPD we learn on the job. So we learn this by doing or by in-house training. But what I'm gonna talk about is some unexpected experiences that happen in your employment. And then finally, serendipity that comes from your interests or from your passions and from other experiences outside of the library world. These types of CPD experiences will be unique to everyone, but the skill and insight to recognize them and to transfer them will be universal. So I'll give you a little bit of a background. I have always loved learning. I was that goober kid who couldn't wait to go back to school in September. It was more than the sheer joy of the new books and the new stationery, it was the fresh start a chance to learn new things. I always had my hand up, trying to answer any questions. I was never the smartest kid in class, and to be honest with you, I can't even remember what grades I got. I was just happy to be there. My enthusiasm was appreciated by my teachers, but not by my classmates. <laughs> I was, upon reflection, an annoying swat. <laughs> this was my first incentive to get loud. Growing up in Chelsea on the Lower West Side of New York was an experience. Kids fought all the time, but I didn't like fighting. I guess I was too delicate. <laughs> so when I arrived home from first grade with yet another black guy, my Aunt Helen, who was legendary for her toughness, took me aside. And she told me she had only ever once been in a fight. I couldn't believe it. How is this possible? No one messed with her. Well, she explained, you've got something a lot stronger than your fist, and it's your voice. And trust me, I have heard you whinge, and you are very loud. <laughs> Use your voice even when you're afraid. If you sound tough, people will think you are. But most importantly, you must use your voice for others who have not found theirs. You must fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. After that, I was only ever in one physical fight in my life, and that was when I was mugged. But I took those words from my aunt and I made them my own, very loud indeed. The best way to learn is just to do it. This can do, learn as you go, we'll figure it out and adjust for me is one of the most remarkable characteristics of librarians. If we wanna achieve something, we just get stuck in. If our library management system isn't producing the reports we want, we figure it out. We figure out a new way to develop them and then we tell everyone else about it. We share with each other, and then we tell the software developer too. 
I played almost every sport there was, and I sucked at most of them. My three favorites were baseball, basketball, and surfing. I participated in these sports for years. My athletic ability improved. I only nearly drowned twice. <laughs> but I, what I learned from this, <laughs> but what I learned from this is referred to as experiential learning. Learning by doing. You can read lots of books about swimming. You can watch YouTube. But if you don't get in the water, you will never be a swimmer. This premise for me identified a learning style and a weird sense of confidence. I don't need to know everything about what I'm doing. I can only prepare so much. The reality is the test, and literally, I can sink or swim. This experiential approach to learning has allowed me to take on roles professionally and voluntarily, and not to be held back. The experience of learning is just as important as the learning itself. I was the librarian at MedAaron for nearly 10 years, and in that role, I learned so much more than librarian skills. Besides maps, it was my first exposure to the visualization of data. What you see here on the slides, on the left, is a tephogram. Forecasting, now casting, or statistical evaluation of weather conditions, patterns, and trends is more important than a decision whether or not to bring an umbrella with you. Lives depend on accurate weather forecasting. The tephogram is a graphical representation of the observations of pressure, temperature, humidity, and it's made by using an instrument called a radio sound, which is, contains, which is launched in the atmosphere by a balloon. So you see a little man up there? Can't, okay. <laughs> if you're ever at Valencia Observatory or at Dublin Airport, you have got to see these giant balloons pop out. Okay, it's fantastic. Especially over a clear, carry sky, it looks like a UFO. On the tephogram, there are two kinds of information represented. The environment curves, which describe the structure of the atmosphere. So these are temperature in red and dew point in green. And this information is useful for the forecaster for lots of reasons. It helps to determine the moisture levels in the atmosphere, cloud heights, forecast maximum and minimum temperatures, and forecast fog formation and fog clearance. On the right side is a weather chart that you'll probably recognize from the news, and it's very familiar. This contains actually numerical weather information that's gathered from a HERLAM system, which is connected to satellites all over Ireland. And what we see here is a graphical output of large amounts of data in a graphical format that is easy to read as the map is an overlay. I was fascinated by these processes and spent a lot of time with my colleagues in the forecasting office, who taught me how these worked, how they were interpreted, and most importantly, the relevance of the standardization of data types, the naming of elements, and most significant understanding of the relevant contextualization of linking information. This is my first introduction to metadata, and the simplicity and the complexity and the wonder of it all. Aside from my librarian colleagues, my colleagues at MedAaron are the only people I know who will completely understand when I say the phrase, data is beautiful. Okay, maybe it's pushing it. <laughs> I'm not allowed to say that at home, so. <laughs> this conceptual understanding of metadata and the appreciation of its many applications helped me learn about practical applications for XML publishing, contextualization, and digital imagery, which prepare me for future roles at the Irish Taxation Institute and Getty Images. Another compo uh, component for my love of data, especially from primary sources, can be attributed to my learning experiences at MedAaron. The library archives hold as part of the collection registers of meteorological observations for approximately 40 sites in Ireland dating back to 1855. These cover temperature, wind, rainfall, solar radiation, snow, and sunshine. I was initially annoyed having to deal with these boxes of old crap. Well, as I viewed them at the time, they took up space and they smelt bad. Um, but there were a few things that helped me change my mind. The first was a request by a member of the public for information about the day that his mother was born. She was celebrating her 80th birthday. He told me his mother was the only person in their family who had red hair and freckles. And when she was a child, her father told her that when the stork brought her, he left her under a rusty bucket with holes in the top. <laughs> she was from Burr. She was from the Burr area, and they wanted to include an official weather report along with newspaper he headlines for her gift box. The general climate database for Burr indicated that the day was dry and sunny. However, 
when I checked the ledger for Burr Castle, I found the same weather information that had been extracted for the database, but another column full of annotations. In the date of her birth, the entry read, weather clear today, bright skies, with the exception of brief rain showers on William Street. William Street is just around the corner from the Burr Observing Station. For me, this was a turning point in the learning and understanding of annotations that appear in archival material. In many ways, they tell the truer story. From this moment of serendipity, I contacted the climate office and told them about this wonderful discovery. They told me if I thought it was that important, I should add it to the database myself. <laughs> so with some instruction, I was let loose, now on my own, to learn not only how databases work, but how to develop them. Now what you see here on the screen is a sample of the extracts from the TCD observing station. Look closely at the signature if you can see that. It's S.A. Clark, and he was a student observer for Trinity College Dublin. And the last, the last entry that he made was on the 24th of April, 1916, the day of the start of the Easter Rising. He never made another entry after that. It was assumed that he had been killed or had been wounded. However, years later, when working on a project for my Digital Humanities Masters, I was using the TCD student registers for another purpose, and they hold such information as the date of graduation, student activities, and lo and behold, I found Sydney. He had graduated, he had been listed as a voluntary observer, and his degree was in science. So another mystery solved. If I ever give up this library gig, I'm gonna become a private investigator. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there's two certainties in life. You've all heard this, death and taxes. I've never been dead, but I have paid taxes, and I have worked at the Irish Taxation Institute for a little over three years. Taxation is boring, people think that, but it's also relevant to every day. How many people got paid this month? Okay, you participated in direct taxation. How many people put a coffee or a soda or something on the way here? You participated in indirect taxation. It's like love, it's all around you. <laughs> the fantastic thing about taxation is that it is a librarian's dream. There are seven major tax heads with clear individual subheads the taxonomical structure of legislation allows for easy cross-linking and contextualization of related information. And if you ever really want to develop your taxonomy skills, spend a weekend with a taxation book. Tax has, <laughs> <laughs> tax has an application for everyday life and is globally connected. If a decision is made in Brussels as to whether or not an onion is a fruit or a vegetable, there's implications for Ireland and the world. A change in a VAT rate can have you shopping for bargains 300 miles from home. While I'm sure I have you excited with my passion for tax, that was not the most significant thing that I learned at the ITI, and it wasn't something that I had expected. The ITI is a professional body of tax advisors in Ireland, and it has a strong member base anchored in its role as the primary education authority. Working in a member-driven organization gave me appreciation for the importance of professional involvement and promotion, the benefits of CPD, networking, and pride, and comfort that comes with being involved with your professional body. There were various levels of membership based on CPD and contribution to the tax profession. Until that time, I had been a marginal member of the LAI for about 10 years. I attended some conferences, I did some CPD. My children at that time were now halfway through secondary school, and I had a bit more personal time. So I decided to investigate how could I get more involved with my membership of my professional body. And then I attended an ANSL event on the encouragement or pushing this, should I say, for my classmate, Katrina Sharkey. And then I was hooked. This turning point of becoming involved with the a academic and special libraries really got me to be connected. I really got involved. And it was the biggest turning point in my career. I felt I had found my tribe, the level of connection, the vast network, the range of skills and people, and the connection to students and other groups and other sections and the executive council. It was for the very first time seeing the links and connections and opportunities and challenges. And for me, it was the answer to the question, what kind of a librarian do I want to be? Getty Images is the leading supplier of stock imagery. 
Almost everyone who worked in vocabulary or the editing departments globally was a librarian. An unusual fit? Not really. Information in online environments, especially in commercial environments, needs to be highly organized, cross-referenced, and easily discoverable. At first, it was like being bombarded with constant million mugshots. There were faces everywhere. And my own family was starting to resent me, forcing them to take pictures that looked like stock images. I was indoctrinated. The skills that were transferable in this kind of environment were the understanding and flexibility that multiple users would be looking for multiple information in lots of different ways. The skills of cataloging and classification were fantastic grounding for the development of taxonomies, as well as all that tax. I was personally responsible for developing a number of fashion taxonomies, and for those of you who know me, that was a huge learning curve. <laughs> The other key learning outcome from working in this environment was a different perception of what a good search is. In an LIS environment, we define a good search as one that matches our users' requirements, uses the best resources, and enhances their research. In a commercial environment, it's a sale. Having your work displayed on a global platform was intimidating. An error in search terms or keywords for the world to see makes you a bit of a neurotic or not. My experiences working with digital images, archives, and sound recordings was challenging, but I was able to see a huge potential for development in this field, and that's when I decided to take a master's in digital humanities at Trinity College. It was a fantastic degree. I learned so much from it, and it gave me a new perspective on archives. An archive holds a memory. The library shares the memory, and it makes it accessible for teaching or learning or research. And digital humanities is the bridge between these two worlds. I undertook a thesis to see what was the role of librarians in the field of digital humanities. It's really big, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But <laughs> overall, my research concluded that Irish librarians have a high level of awareness of digital humanities, and particularly in the subject area and its applications. And librarians primarily see their roles in the development of the field as facilitators of research, followed by being collaborators, providing solutions which allow increased access for users. And many also felt that the field was being developed by using existing library skills. I know, Siobhan, you're going to talk a bit more about digital humanity, so I'll, I'll stop with that. There are lots of heroes at Children's University Hospital, Temple Street. Not just the celebrities like Brian O'Driscoll, who, but the sick children, their parents, the nurses, the doctors. They're the real heroes. This was a temporary part-time role, and I was so lucky to get it. After a recent redundancy and several months into the completion of my master's in digital humanities, it was a perfect fit. However, on the second day of working in the hospital, I fell outside my dentist's office and fractured my right elbow in two places. I was now fractured physically and emotionally, but I needed the job, so I just got on with things. Challenges of the hospital, the physical layout, the cramped conditions, the rough area of Dublin, the vulnerability of sick patients, Help me get myself in order. I did a complete reality check. I remember what it was like when my son was sick and I brought him into the emergency room. How frightened I was. And then how relieved I was when I put him in the hands of capable staff. I stepped outside of myself and I looked for opportunities where I could help, where I could share these fantastic library skills that I had. So I contacted the nursing research department. I worked with them on developing their research program, but in particular their annual seminar and this is where I used all the skills that I learned from ANSL. The social work department needed a small repository, so I contacted librarians in the space for advice, and I tried to model as best I could on the great work done by Aoife Lawton with Linus. I helped with fundraising, trick or treat for Temple Street, I wake up singing that in the night, still rings in my head. And then one morning something happened that had the biggest impact on me. The library in Temple Street has a window that backs onto the alleyway. And not more than two feet away is the window into accident and emergency. This is the part of the job I always hated. It was the crying. Not the annoying, I want to miss the whippy and I didn't get it crying, but the kind of cry that's a child in pain, or worse, one who's scared. Music was coming from the window, and like the follower of the Pied Piper, I had to follow it. And it took me to the middle of A&E, where one of the chaplains, Sister Julie, was playing the guitar and getting children and their parents to sing Christmas carols. I found out that she was trying to get people to come to the nativity play that afternoon. 
Now, if any of you have children, you know the first nativity play is adorable. If that, it's like really annoying. <laughs> but I went anyway. And it was adorable, and it was sweet and funny, especially one of the wise men fainted. He fell on Mary. Joseph got up to help him, pulled it out his IV, and screamed off, fuck, feck. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the thing that was the learning experience for me was the Christmas tree. I had never seen anything like it in my life. It was huge. It was covered in white lights and beautiful little white ornaments. Afterwards, I met with the chaplains. And I asked them, what is this tree? Where did these ornaments come from? That's what they told me. Women in the local area make identical ornaments for bereaved parents, one to take home and one to hang on the tree. Further probing revealed that while these were packed away with care, every year there were no records about them. There were no individual pictures. So I decided to put my digital humanity skills to good use and I worked on this project. Working alongside the chaplains, we developed an image archive. Each ornament was photographed and metadata was add, added to describe the material used, the level of ornamentation, and any kind of detail that were known about the creators. I was lucky to meet one of the local women, and she explained to me lots of things. Everything that's shiny is not a rhinestone. I now have an extensive vocabulary and understanding of haberdashery. <laughs> Beyond that, what I experienced and truly learned was the value of an object in an archive. To hold in my hand something that had to be preserved in case of loss or damage. I finally had the full understanding of the duty of preservation and curation of archival items, all of which at some point were made by someone's hand, reflected someone's work or their heart's desire, and had value that no currency could ever be applied to. Another amazing skill and environment that was introduced while being a member of the academic and special library section was presenting the annual careers breakfast at UCD. This is my first reconnection with library students, and I loved it. At the end of the presentation, like most of us do, and like I'll do today, I put my contact details. And you know what? They got in touch. Suddenly now, I was being asked to review CVs, coach for interviews, give life advice. But I did that. I was nervous at first because I was terrified to give poor information or to mislead somebody or particularly when students are graduating, they're quite vulnerable. But one of the things I found out when I got involved with reading their CVs was that things had changed a lot in the curriculum and in the job market. I was challenged to learn even more about these changes in the field, the new technology and new approaches to learning. And I found this approach to helping others identify required skills that were transferable, helped me realize my skills and lack of them and encouraged to get my own skills up to date. Now last evening, I attended a student conference organized by two former pupils, and they're here today, Helena Byrne and Claire Murnane. They're speaking at the conference, so I won't give too much away, but a little over a year ago, they decided to set up a blog called SLIP, Students, Librarians, and Information Professionals. This blog evolved for need for more dialogue and all things theoretical and practical for students, librarians, and information professionals. To imagine that the success of a blog would develop into a conference is amazing. I think SLIP is an invaluable link to the LIS profession. It's student driven by student engagement and not just with students at UCD, but students from other library schools throughout Ireland, including the University of Ulster and Dublin Business School. I love teaching at UCD and I find surrounded, being surrounded by young enthusiastic people has reinvigorated me from my own enthusiasm about our profession. One of the best things I love about teaching at UCD is the support I receive from my colleagues some of who are here in the room today, who come to my class, speak about practical and realistic changes that are happening in the world of libraries, and other colleagues in organizations who take my students in for case studies and interviews. By being able to present to the class this cohesive, supported, and networked community of colleagues makes me feel supported, but it also demonstrates to them the collective identity of what an information professional is in Ireland. I really don't like presenting, it makes, me, it makes me nervous. It makes me wonder, will I be effective in commuting, communicating, communicating what I'm trying to say? <laughs> but I do them anyway. And the reason I do them is the same reason I go to other people's talks, is I'm hoping that in some way, my experience that I have had or information that I have learned will benefit others. I present regularly about the importance of CPD 
and membership and engagement with the Library Association of Ireland. The most important thing I have learned from all of my CPD, formally and informally, is that librarians are amazing. We come from all walks of life, we work in many different sectors, but we are united in so many ways. Individually and collectively, we are the body of knowledge of library, we are affecting the body of library users in Ireland, and collectively by the work that we do, we are affecting the development of our profession, and our care for one another is what is demonstrating the difference, and it defines us as information professionals. The world of social media reflects our level of engagement, our level of encouragement and connectivity, in particular, our involvement with Twitter. I took the list of librarians that are on Twitter from the Lib Focus list, and there are 254 of us. 22 of you have your accounts locked, so you're knocked off the list. <laughs> 232 are available for relationship analysis, and this is what you see. This Gephi visualization represents the level of tweeting and retweeting by us for the past 1,500 tweets. This is as of last week. I think this image is beautiful, and I think it's meaningful. It represents the way in which we share ideas, we communicate, to create a world of access to information for ourselves and for others. These values join us to one another. Librarians can make a difference, and we do make a difference. Thank you. We have time for about one question, if Jane wants to answer some questions. Make it nice. If anyone has questions. <laughs> Neve? Okay, well, listen, I'm around for today and tomorrow, so if you have any questions, oh, just okay. find me. Oh, oh, here we go. There's always one. Always one. <laughs> Hi, Jane. Great talk, as always. Um, I'm not reverbing. Um, I wonder, could you speak to the emotional labor that is part of every librarian's job in dealing with students who are stressed or patrons who are stressed or who are you know, undergoing research that's very close to their heart um, and kind of what your experience has been of managing that while keeping a distance as well so as not to kind of end up too involved with the student or too kind of invested in that particular um, project, you know, sacrificing other students, other patrons, um, kind of other projects. Uh, I think that's a really hard question. And I, for me, I know it's very hard because I, I think it's come across as quite an emotional person. But I think um, when you have a student who's stressed, sometimes the challenging thing that, or a user of information services, whether it's a library or databases or whatever, it usually comes across as aggression. And when they're aggressive with you, the first thing you want to do is get aggressive with them. And you don't want to help them. But if you can see behind that, what's generating that aggression is real fear and fear of incompetence. I think that's one way. To dissect it from you, it's not nothing to do with you, it's the process. The other thing that I like to do when people are, you know, they're very caught up. I mean, you do any research, do any writing, it's very personal. I always say to people, look, you're writing this PhD thesis, MLAS thesis. Tell me about it, in, tell me about it in 10 words. What is it about? And if they can break it down to 10 words, it kind of calms them down. Because if they start going around in circles and circles, that's what's happening, that's in their head. So if you can get people to kind of focus, that helps a lot. The other thing that I like to do is I always like to give them examples. So I said, you know, I don't know what you're feeling, because I don't know what anybody else is feeling, but when I was doing this, this is what I found helpful. And that kind of helps them a little bit. So I think the main thing is try to not take it personally, be detached, and try to explain to people that it's a process. You know, writing a thesis or writing a paper, people feel very personal, it's their life work. It's just a paper. I had a, the best teacher I ever had in my life was a college, uh, when I was in uh, on third level in college, and he was an English teacher. And I kept asking for deadlines and deadlines, and you know, I was, was jeopardizing graduation. And it was the best advice I said, he ever gave me. He said, listen, for Christ's sake, nobody's expecting Shakespeare. Write the fucking paper. <laughs> so that's what I did. You know, I got a D, I passed, I graduated. So end of. I hope that helps. 